In part 6 of this series, we recognize that there will be challenges that come in life and every married couple needs to learn how to overcome them. We share a simple word of encouragement on overcoming challenges and to press forward in life by releasing the hurts, wounds and scars of the past. Would you all kindly just turn your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. If your neighbor doesn't have a Bible, kindly share. Let's be Christian in church. It says, 1 Peter 1 verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For those of you all who are mothers, you probably have spent the last two weeks teaching your children with the exams that are coming up, yes? So while I was doing that with my son, Jeremy, we were learning science and his current lesson is the process of germination. And I found it very intriguing that um, uh, in the, the lesson of germination talks a lot about the seed. So when I was looking through that, I found a lot of parallels from what is there in the seed as well as what is, uh, is what is referred to as the seed and what is referred to in the Bible. So what it said is, one of the things it said is that a seed naturally has life in it. A seed naturally has life in it. But with our physical senses, if you hold a seed, you can't hear the life, you can't see life, you can't touch life, you can't taste life. It looks absolutely dead, right? But then how do you prove that it is alive? You prove it only if you plant it. It's only when it's planted that it actually gives life. The second thing that I found was that a seed will not grow if it is not nourished. So if it is left in your shelf, it's not going to grow out into a baby plant, although it has life in it. And thirdly, a seed, when it is nourished, it will grow out, it will cut through the dirt and the rocks and form a plant. So let's look at the parallels. What did we read today? The word of God is an what? It's a imperishable seed. You know what the word imperishable means? It means it's incapable of dying, which means God's word is not dead. It is alive. Whatever, uh, whatever it has to accomplish, it will come forth because it is the word of God. So when you actually parallel it, it says God's word has life in it. But then it is, if you just look at it in your Bible, it looks dead. When is it, and through your physical senses, it just cannot, it does not show life. But when does it come out to grow? In, to grow? It's when you plant it. Plant it where? Not under your pillows. You plant it in the depths of your heart. And that's when the life of God's word comes about. So how do you nourish it? You nourish it by speaking the word of God. You nourish it daily and let it grow when, it spe when you speak the word of God. And lastly, what does the word of God do? It cuts through every obstacle, every problem, every issue in order to, for you to bear fruit and bear a harvest. Amen? So, so today, even as we declare, we need to understand that God's word is imperishable and it will, it is living, it has life in it, it is up to us to make sure that we plant it, it is up to us that we make sure that we nourish it. So even as we stand up and make our declaration, let's be intentional about doing so. Come on, can we stand up? Hold your Bibles high up in the air and repeat after me. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master. 
And to him, I am an absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. For those of us, those of y'all who are visiting with us, um, we are doing a series on marriage and family. And for the past uh, five weeks, we have been learning a lot about marriage and family. And I believe that it has enriched many of us sitting here. Yes? Can I hear an emphatic yes? Okay, okay thank you. Right, so today we're going to look at very um, important aspects about marriage. One is overcoming life's challenges, and the second one is pressing forward by releasing the past. Overcoming life's challenges, pressing forward by releasing the past. Now, if we all are human, you would agree with me that each one of us face challenges, yes? Maybe even this morning to come just to church, you probably would have gone through a lot of challenges of waking up early, making sure that your lunch is ready, making sure you get the best clothes out. You know, we do all have challenges. So if we are human, we, we can be sure that we have challenges. So no one is exempt from challenges. In fact, the Lord Jesus in his word, in John 16 verse 33 said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So God says, you will have tribulation. All because we are Christians does not keep us exempt from having tribulation. So we will have tribulation. But the good news is that we can walk in peace and in confidence, knowing that we can overcome each of our challenges, right? The Bible also says that no test or temptation comes our way except that which is common to man. So if you think you're the only one who's having a hard time, pat, the purse, pat yourself and say, don't worry, even your neighbor's having a problem, right? We all have challenges. We all do have. So it is common to everybody. Like I always say, if you don't have challenges, something is wrong. Come to me, okay? Right. Now the point uh, is, how do we respond to challenges? So how we respond to challenges basically de determines its outcome. So one of the things that challenges help us do, it can either make you or it can break you. So there can be times that your cha cha challenge will paralyze you and pin you down, or it can perfect you, or it can propel you into God's bigger purposes. Now, one big example that I've seen in, 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 um, uh, in life is about a person by name Nick Vyojic. How many of you have? Okay, I'm sure a lot of you have. He's an Australian who was born without ha hands and legs. So the, essentially, it's only this much that is a part of his body. Now, he's around, I think, 35 years old. And... Initially, when he was growing, it was a huge challenge. You, you, should, you should listen to his uh, testimony. He talks about how he, at, at the age of seven, he wanted to commit suicide. But then when he, um, when he invited the Lord Jesus into his heart, there were, there were changes. And he goes around to, to different nations, to different places, different institutions, talking about the love of God and talking about how challenges really need not diminish you. So challenges can either make you or break you. Challenges could make life very interesting. You know, if you don't have challenges, it's a very boring life. You know, you just eat, sleep, go to work, come back. It's extremely boring, but that's what actually makes life interesting. It can help to it can help you discover many new things about yourself. It's only when you get a challenge that you understand, hey, I can actually go through this. I was able to, to, um, to have a better outcome of what my challenge actually brought into. Challenges also can help us grow. Like in all areas that have challenges, you would agree that even in marriage, we have challenges. In marriage too, we are not devoid of challenges. But when we made our first commitment to our spouse, when you said your, your vows to your spouse, you know what you committed to? I don't know how many of you remember, but you committed to being with them in spite of the many 
challenges that you had. So although we just said those words probably in two lines, it had actually deep meaning. So what did you actually say? You said, in every season of life, through sickness and health, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, that's what you said. You committed to marriage, knowing that there will and there can be challenges. So what is essential for us is to look back at our vows and know that we have made a word to our spouse that we will be with them in spite of the challenges. So let's consider some of life's challenges that can actually take place. So one of the things is, as it says in the vow, is for better or for worse. So when you look at your marriage, you know, there may be some days or some years that you're a very lovey-dovey. You get onto the bike, you hold your husband and, and, and drive through. And there are some days that you wish you never could, you know, you'd keep that much of a space between you and your spouse. You know, the, the love is not there. There is no desire. So you find that there are times when you, you, you that there are good times and there are as well bad times. But even in those times, Lala, we need to make sure that we keep our faith strong and our spirits full of joy even when we go through those uh, worse seasons of our life. The other challenge that we face is for richer or for poorer. <clears throat> so bef maybe before marriage, as a, as, as a single person, you would have probably come from quite a well-to-do family where there were a lot of luxuries, you had a car of your own, you had a driver, you had maids. But then when you got into marriage, you probably had to start with basic and simple beginnings, which, which becomes a challenge. Or there may be times in through marriage, what happens is you, you have a financial difficulty, which, which kind of breaks you and you, you kind of figure that, you know, there's probably fi finances have been hit. So in spite, during this time, the point is that we stick together and extend our faith for God's provision and abundance. Another challenge that we face is for sickness and in health, in sickness and in health. We can never, never predict what will be our health tomorrow. And at times like that, the point and, and the calling that we have, the commitment we have is to stick together. I have a live example in my own family. I have an aunt who has rheumatoid arthritis, and she has been bedridden for the last 25 years. Um, so initially, in her years of marriage, she served the family. She, had, she has two boys. She used to serve the family, do everything for them, but then came a point of time when she got ill progressively, and even they're, they're still alive today. And the only person who looks after her is her 80-year-old husband, so much so that he carries her from the bed, takes her to the bathroom, feeds her, cooks, cooks for her, everything single-handedly. So the fact is, this is, a re this is reality. It can happen to us. So what do we do at a time like this? Again, stick together and believe God for wholeness. Believe God for faith, uh, sorry, for healing and uh, recovery. Another challenge that we could probably come up with are unmet expectations. There sometimes is a challenge when expectations are not met. So before you were married, you probably have a certain course of, um, certain course of life that you have desired. But when you get married, you just figure out that everything has come under ruins. Your expectations are being delayed or it will probably never come about. And what happens, that actually crushes the spirit. In fact, in Proverbs, it's written, when hope is crushed, the heart is crushed, but a wish come true fills you with joy. So an unmet expectation can leave you disappointed. It can leave you distressed. It can leave you clueless as to how to go ahead. But we must still remember that God has brought the two of you together and everything works together for Good. Amen. Another challenge that we face is when things just don't seem to be working. If you have, if you've been, if you have courted before your marriage, you probably have been the best of friends, you know, and you say, this is the person. We're never going to have trouble. I've heard so many young people come in and say, I'll never have trouble with this person who I'm going to marry. He's going to be the best. And what, what happens is that after marriage, all these small, little, insignificant differences become really, really big. It gets into a vicious cycle, 
and you just can't get along, you just don't know how to go ahead, it becomes very, very burdensome, right? The things that may look, have looked cute and cuddly turns out to be very, very annoying and irritating. So there are times that our expectations are not met. But it's at this point of time that we need to reach out to God and reach out to others to help us. I believe that many of us have been there. Personally, we have been there, where we have had a lot of unmet um, expectations. But then that, that was really difficult for us at the initial years of our life. Sometimes it still is. But it's the point of where we need to reach out for help, get to God and ask him to give us the grace. Another challenge is domestic violence and abuse. In some situations, there can be violence, emotional or physical abuse. So one or both, both the husband and the wife can turn very aggressive. And although they did not expect that life would be a life of abuse, it turns out to be one, uh, one such. I must say that this is an extremely unhealthy way of relating with each other, and it definitely needs external help. The next challenge that we probably face is irresponsibility and neglect. Sometimes there is neglect from one of the spouses where, where they show irresponsibility in doing the work that they're supposed to do, leaving the other partner completely full up uh, in, in having to manage the house single-handedly and bear the burden by themselves. At such cases, it is, again, um, it, it's something that we, we need to understand, that we need to hold on, and if needed, get extra help. The last and the worst of all is when there is unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness when the spouse is unfaithful, which leads to adultery. This can be extremely damaging, not only for the people in the marriage, but also for those who are um, in, within the family as well. So, we do have challenges. So, as a believer, what do we do? We can't help it. There are challenges. It do comes about. So, how do we overcome? As we saw earlier in John chapter 16, verse 33, what does it say? Were you all awake? It says, in this life you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So what is God actually telling you? God is saying that he has overcome the world. He has taken care of things in the world so that we can overcome whatever may come our way. So as a believer, when challenges come, we need to understand that we are called overcomers. We are called overcomers. God also said, as a believer in Jesus, you are born of God. You are a child of God. And because you are a child of God, you can conquer everything in the world. I will read that verse for you. This is actually quite new to me. It says... In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, every God-begotten person conquers the world's ways. What does that mean? For whoever is born of God overcomes and conquers the world. So if you are born of God, you are a conqueror. So you are an overcomer as well as you are a conqueror. And again, as a believer, what are you expected to do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says... Now, thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So God always leads us in, leads us in triumph. He leads us in triumph. So we are to believe his word and give every situation to him knowing that he will lead us in triumph. So while we are going through these challenges, we need to understand that we are an overcomer. Can, we, can I hear it loud and strong? An overcomer, a conqueror, and triumphant. So even though things look very bleak, you may be in one of the challenges that we just described. But God gives you that hope, telling you that you can overcome, you can be a conqueror, and you can be led in triumph through his word. Now, even as we face challenges as a believer, it is important to understand not to let our past 
or our present dictate the future not to let what happened or what is happening to dictate what is going to happen so what does it mean to overcome a challenge does it mean overcoming a challenge always is to necessarily reverse the challenge not necessary but what it actually means is for us to triumph over the devastation that the challenge brings so overcoming challenge doesn't necessarily mean that you reverse it but it means to overcome the pain and the devastation that comes through it now there are two kinds of um situations some that can be reversed so probably you know um if you have lost a job if 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 you have been in that season where you have lost a job it is a challenge but it is something that can be reversed you probably believe and have faith in god to give you a good job and you've actually got it so it's not that you have not been through a season of difficulty but you've been through a point where you have seen the goodness of god and god has led you out into a better provision and into a better in, into abundance of 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 of, of wealth or of, of finance so that could be something that's reversed or probably if we have faced health issues some of us may have had different kind of diseases that 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 has been very challenging but we have been healed we have been restored we have been made whole through the word of god so our point is to look back and look at how god has led us out through those challenges because it gives us hope for things that are not reversible sometimes the the challenges that we have are not reversible for example the death of a spouse or if there is infidelity or unfaithfulness this can be extremely painful but we need to ask god to give us the strength to be able to push forward we need to remember we ne- we should not become prisoners of our past so don't be jailed in your past rather than take god's god's word as a key to open out and get what he has in store for you so since we've spoken about challenges we need to look at some practical ways of how to overcome these challenges <clears throat> one of the things that we need to look at is how to guard your heart sometimes when challenges come up along with it comes a big package of negative feelings it's probably fear that can grip you it can be anger disappointment hurt bitterness name it it's all there with a challenge that is what actually can grip your heart and make you feel extremely bitter and lifeless there are points of time that we need to guard our hearts from being angry towards god i think that's something that we all can relate to at points of time when we are faced with a challenge you ask god why me why did you choose me for this it isn't fair the point is to remember not to do so not to do this not to be angry with god it is good to actually bear out your heart to him but we have seen that many people who have not guarded their heart against anger towards god have fallen away fallen away from the promises and gone away so what is it that we need to do in order to guard our hearts two things it's basically having a nice heart surgery a bypass surgery so how do we do that The first way is keeping God's word inside your heart. Keeping God's word inside your heart. The second is you recognize that there is a block. You recognize that there is a bitterness and release it to God and say God, let your spirit fill me with what should be there. So how do you guard your heart? Make sure that you plant God's word in your heart. secondly recognize where the block is and release it in prayer to the holy spirit to fill you up your attitude is what really matters at the times of challenge it's not the challenge in itself we all face challenges but it is what you do with the challenge that really matters what is the second thing as to how we overcome life's challenges we overcome evil with good Romans 12 verse 91 uh, sorry Romans chapter 12 verse 19 to 21 says never take revenge my friends by but instead let God's anger do it for the scripture says i will take revenge i will pay back says the lord now if you've been married you probably know about the tit for tat mechanism 
You know what that is? Tit for tat, butter for fat, you kill my cat, I kill your rat. So what is it that we do? When we're angry with our spouse, we give them the silent treatment, make them suffer. Right? Or just poison their coffee a little bit <laughs> every day. Right? Or give them, or make sure that you don't iron his shirt. Or make sure that you don't fill enough gas for her to go uh, on the road so that she gets stuck and then she has to push her way through. So the fact is that that's not how God operates, although that's how the world asks you to do. You know, if he hasn't done that, you leave him. If he doesn't do this, you also stop doing so. But then fortunately, and praise God, that his w ways are much, much, much higher than our ways. Amen? Yeah. And it is natural to want to take matters in your own hand, to retaliate, to give back, to make sure that you give them that bad coffee or that wrinkled shirt, whatever. It, it is natural. But we are, we, we are intentional and we choose to step away from that and allow God to step in. You know, it's better that God steps in rather than God will do a better job. Don't you agree? Right, so then it, it is important that we overcome evil with good. So God takes it a little extra and says, do a good thing. You pay back unrighteousness for righteousness. You pay back forgiveness for offense. You pay back something bad for good. That's what God actually encourages us to do, to overcome evil with good, to love them even when you feel hate. Now that's extremely difficult to do. I've been there, so I, I know how difficult it is to do. But it is important that when we actually speak the word of God, saying, okay, God, I have to overcome evil with good today, it will come. It will come because the Holy Spirit will put that seed in and it will just flourish, it will just grow. What is another way that we can... A practical way is to keep exercising our faith. Our natural instinct is then when a difficulty comes, it's like a curse to be avoided. You know, I don't want difficulties. It's like a curse. But then I found this phrase very uh, helpful. Don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Because it has, it, it has, it tells me that God does not want me to get out of a difficulty because he wants to test my faith. And I want to be a person of great faith. So if you're in a difficulty, thank God and say, yes, God, help me to build my faith. So when you look at Jesus in his life and in his ministry, you will see how he encouraged his people to have faith. So when they were on the boat, he stilled the waters. And what did he tell his disciples? This is a wake-up call. What did he tell his disciples? You can be louder. Either you don't know the answer or you haven't figured out my question. So what did he tell the disciples? Where is your faith? That's what he asked the disciples. The second thing, the second instance is when Jairus' daughter dies. You know, they, she's, she's dead and Jairus comes to and says, you know, make your way home. It's okay. So what does Jesus say? Didn't I tell you, just believe. Just believe. So God so Jesus actually, in every situation, encourages his people. The other situation is about Lazarus. Lazarus is dead for four days, and Martha comes to him crying, and Jesus says, didn't I tell you you would see God's glory if you believed? So God calls us to a life of faith in the midst of our challenges. So you need to know that God is in control, absolutely in control. He will never, never lose control. It is us who loses control. And at that time, he instructs us to be in faith. So what does faith help us to do? Faith ushers us rest. I know there are many of us who just, especially when we go through a difficult marriage, you know, there are times we sit in our beds and say, God, I just want to sleep. I've heard people say, I just want to run away. Yes? We've, we've all felt that at times when it's been challenging. I just want to go. I just want to have peace. I just don't want to think. But you know what God says? His faith ushers in the peace, ushers in the rest. He ushers in the calm. It says in Isaiah 30 verse 15, come back and quietly trust in me, then you will be strong and secure. So when you put your trust in him, that's the place of security and rest. 
not at times of worry or fighting back or, or doing evil things. It's at the place of rest. So I want to challenge each one of you, wherever, whatever your situation is today, to go back and say, God, I know I don't have that faith, but, but, to, but to obey what you have said, help me, help me to grow in the faith in you. The last one is to take small but positive steps. So how God leads us through these challenges can be very, very different. But it is important for us to take small steps to walk through these challenges. It may be important to sometimes get uh, the help of God's people. You may need a spiritual mentor or a counselor or a pastor to help you through your difficult situations. For example, if you're going through situations financially, you have a difficult financial situation, it is okay to go and get the help of a professional financial advisor who will help you through that challenge. Or suppose you are grieving the death of a loved one. It is okay, it is needed that you take the step to maybe meet with a few friends who can pray for you, who can encourage you, who can take you through that period of grieving. Or if you have gone through separation or divorce, it is good to get the help, professional help, to see you through that season. So God does want us to take small incremental steps to, to take us through the valley of challenges. Very often, God's way to bring us out of this pit is for us to do our part as well. Sometimes we just sit and say, God, I don't know, I can't do anything more. I'm just, I raise my hands up. But God expects of us to walk in wisdom, to think long term, to get extra help so that he can take us out of what we are going through. Right, even as we move on, we're going to touch upon a few areas of life's challenges where biblical instruction needs to be given. One is when there is an unsaved spouse in your marriage. When there is an unsaved spouse in your marriage. I just want to read through God's word because it's always best to know what God says in this situation. It's, uh, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 to 16. I'm reading this. To the others I say, I myself and not the Lord, if a Christian man has a wife who is an unbeliever and she agrees to go on living with him, he must not divorce her. And if a Christian woman is married to a man who is an unbeliever and he agrees to go on living with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made acceptable to God by being united to his wife and the unbelieving wife is made acceptable to God by being united to her Christian husband. If this were not so, their children would be like, like pagan children, but as it is, they are acceptable to God. However, if the one who is not a believer wishes to leave the Christian partner, let it be so. In such cases, the Christian partner, whether husband or wife, is free to act. Um, God has called you to live in peace. How can you be sure, Christian wife, that you will not save your husband? Or how can you be sure, Christian husband, that you will not save your wife? Now, there are very key instructions that we can elicit from this passage. There is one in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 2, where it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. What are the key instructions? One of it is, if you have an unsaved spouse, we need to avoid divorce or separation and live peacefully together. Avoid divorce and separation and live peacefully together. So it is said in Ephesians that the believing wife has to walk in respect and submission to the non-believing husband. And this has to be in the Lord. This has to be as long as there is no violation of faith. It ha the, unbelie the believing wife needs to respect and be in submission to the husband. What is the second instruction? God will bless your spouse and your children through your faith in him. So if you are the believer here, God's word says he will bless your spouse and your children. And I think that is an extremely comforting thought for those of us who are married to unbelievers. However, if the spouse willfully abandons and leaves because of the difference in faith, then let him or her depart in peace. Now, this is only for the unbelieving spouse, not for the believing spouse. I hope you have noticed that. If the unbelieving spouse wishes to abandon, now willfully abandons and leaves, let them depart in peace. 
the believing uh, spouse is free to dissolve the marriage and move on. Another aspect that we're going to look at is divorce and remarriage. Even as we just touch upon this, I do want to, um, I do understand that there may be some of us sitting here who are in that season of life. I need to also reiterate that we do not bring this uh, word out of, to condemn you or to make you feel negative. It is to, it is just to bringing the word out in life and what God has said in its truth. But we must, we want to say we want to do it with absolute love and absolute gentleness even as we give you these instructions. So what does it say about divorce and marriage? If you have looked up on the screen, there are around four uh, passages that talks about divorce and marriage. Now, since you will be getting the booklet, I, I suggest that you go back, read it, um, and uh, I'm just going to give you certain gists of what it is said. The scripture makes it extremely clear that God does not approve of divorce. God does not approve of divorce, so we must operate out of that understanding and out of that instruction. But in the midst of marital conflict and distress, we need to understand, especially for those who are going through extreme challenges, we need to understand and refuse to talk about divorce. One thing that I generally tell the people who come to me for counseling, that's a rule that I send them with. At any point of time that you have a conflict, you will not talk about divorce or separation. Because you're making a concerted effort to work on it, you will not talk about divorce or separation. So, so we must understand that we must refuse to bring up those words, div divorce, as an, as an option. We need, we, we need to also understand that we do not consider divorce as a solution to all marriage problems. Definitely not. We do not consider divorce as a solution. But there are only two valid reasons for divorce, <clears throat> as it is said in the word. One is adultery, and the second is abandonment. However, even in such situations, we encourage that couples make an effort to work it out. Make every effort to work out the conflict or work out the situation between them. And then, if at a point of time, uh, they, are, they are free to exercise a choice. There may be other situations, such as abuse, destructive behaviors, neglect, that sometimes do lead to a divorce. There could be situations where one person is desiring to, to work on the marriage, whereas the other wants to opt out. We need to understand that this may not be God's best for them, but yet they may make this kind of a choice. So as believers, those of us who have marriages that are intact, what is our response to people who are undergoing a divorce? Maybe a brother or a sister, okay? It is important for us to make, to, to be gentle, to be loving, to be supportive through their divorce. We need to remember that divorce is absolutely painful and devastating for the people who go through it. It's not easy for them. They take a real hard call to actually um, uh, undergo a separation or undergo a divorce. So for us who are believers, it is important that we do not condemn, but we help them and support them as best as possible. What we can do is believe and pray for God's mercy and redemptive work in their lives. And if God, at a point of time or a course of time, they choose to remarry, we need to bless them. However, we need to mention that we do not support that in, indiscriminate, random divorce, remarriage, divorce, remarriage kind of a pattern because that is against God's instruction for marriage. But we do it only through and within biblical instruction. The other two areas that are uh, looked into in this manual is the death of a spouse as well as Remar death and remarriage. Uh, we're not covering that topic here, but then you can go back when you get the manual, look into that area. Okay, I finished my first half. Say amen. Okay, now you're saying, oh gosh, it's going to go on. Okay, we're getting into the second part of uh, <coughs> the message, which is pressing forward by releasing the past. Pressing forward by releasing the past. Now, even as we journey through life, 
with the kind of challenges that come up, the kind of conflicts that come up within a marriage relationship, it can cause a lot of hurt, a lot of wounds, and a lot of scars. Especially in those relationships where there is abuse, where there is neglect, where there is divorce, where there is um, unfaithfulness, there can be a lot of deep gashes in our hearts. And this, this next part is just a word of encouragement, a short word of encouragement to challenge each one of us who probably have been wounded in our marriage or even in any other form of a relationship. Even though you're not married, even though you're a single you can still apply the truth of what we are, we are going to be discussing. The Bible says, even my best friend, the one I trusted most, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. Do you know who wrote this? You can be confident, yes. Yes, David. David spoke about how the hurt and wounds from a close friend has been very, very traumatic for him. So much for all those of us who are married, who have been under a, a point of challenge or a point of conflict where we have had those hurts and wounds. We need to understand that the past or the pain that we've had should not rob us uh, from going, from moving forward. The Bible says that God is the restorer of our hurts, of our pain, and our gashes and, and everything. God is the one who restores us. If you look through the Bible, I'm not going to read out the verses, but if you look through the Bible, it says, God restores my soul. He says that he has turned our mourning into dancing. Psalm 30 says, he has turned my mourning into dancing. He has taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. He is the one who restores our soul. It also says in Isaiah chapter 61, he says that he's the one who will heal the brokenhearted. He's the one who consoles us. So very often when we are hurt, the first point or first person we go to may be a good friend. But what God invites us and says, come to me, come to me. I will give you, I will give you beauty for ashes. I will give you a garment of praise in place of heaviness. I will give you joy in the place of mourning. So God is the one who restores all that deep negative hurt that we have into becoming a whole person. The next thing that we are expected to do when we have hurts is the power of forgiveness. Now even as I speak these words, there may be a situation or a person that come, pops into your mind reminding you of something in your life. Yes? Yes. Whenever we talk about forgiveness, there comes that face or that situation in front of us, you know, like those gaping monsters that tells you that you have not done what you're supposed to do. But we know that the command is to forgive, but it is extremely difficult. We want to hold back. We want to give it. We want to we want to make them feel miserable. We want to make sure that that we don't forgive. We hold it. We we keep that grudge for 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 ages and ages and years and years to just know that your husband is not losing sleep on his behavior. Who's losing the sleep when you haven't forgiven him? You have. Your husband is not the one who's getting ulcers. You're the one. Or your wife is not the one who's getting blood pressure because of unforgiveness. It's you. So how much ever you look at it, if we keep that unforgiveness in our heart, it just tends to hurt us more and more. Try this experiment when you go home. Okay, you should hold your fist as tightly as possible. And try and do it for at least a minute. After a minute, you feel very uncomfortable. I challenge you to do it for the whole day. What happens? It will turn out to be a sick part of your body. That's what happens when we hold unforgiveness. It becomes, it festers, it becomes hurtful. We tend to be something different. We become bitter, we become, we become different people. That's the power of unforgiveness in our lives. So it's important that what the word of God says is that we need to keep ourselves from hate. Let me just read a verse. 
It's in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. He, say, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now don't nudge me and say it doesn't say spouse, it only says brother. Okay, this message is for us that we keep ourselves from walking in hate. So whether, when we carry hate, we become, like I said, we become extremely bitter. It becomes very intolerable. The situation becomes very intolerable. At, at times when you have a conflict with your husband or wife and don't talk for two, three days, when the spin drops silence, is, it a, is that silence killing? It's intolerable. But God commands us to to not walk in hate. In fact, the antidote that he says is to release forgiveness. Is to release forgiveness. So it said in Luke 17, 3 to 4, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in one day, and each time he comes to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. That's very hard for sometimes for wives to do. He comes seven times and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he said, no, you, I forgave you yesterday, today, and the afternoon before. No, that's it, that's it. But God says we must release forgiveness and the wrong. Jesus, what did Jesus do? He forgave those who persecuted him. So God, Jesus has given us a, um, a he has given us in, in every area of our life, he has given us a way that we need to follow. And it is a blessing when we follow that. So if, if I'm talking to you, if I'm talking to you at, um, about forgiveness, look at that area where you are holding something against your spouse or, some, or, or, or some, something about somebody. Remember that God is asking you to forgive. Next is the power of forgetting. We generally hear it say, no, I can forgive, but I just can't forget. I can forgive, but I just can't forget what the person has done to me. You know, we will be ashamed when we hear what God's word says. What does it say? Rem God remembers our sins no longer. Isn't it a shame when we say we can't forget? Because if God can actually remember your sins no longer, how much more should we be doing it? Because in the word it says, he's taken off our sins as far as from the, yes, east from the west. He's also said that he buries it in the depths of the sea. He also says, he cleanses us forever, wiping away our offenses. So God has forgotten it. God does not remember it. So much more for us to follow, a model to follow. We may recall the incident. I'm not saying we won't recall it. We will recall it. It is natural to recall it. But when we forget and when we forgive, we are releasing the pain. We are giving away the pain of, of that entire situation. I think an important <clears throat> thing to remember when we forget is, if you have been a runner, if you've been an athlete, one of the biggest training that they give you is when you're doing your sprint, you should never look back. Why? If you look back, you have maybe in a split second, you have someone else taking your place. We never should look back. So also, when there is an issue with, with our spouse, with, 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 with someone who we have a conflict, we need to keep our focus forward. Forward, keeping our focus on God, not looking back at what the person has done. Because it's sure to trip you down. It's sure to lose your lose your first place in your race so he he asks that we have our eyes looking forward only at him the only time that you look back is when you want to look back at his goodness otherwise don't look back do not look back forget forget what has happened in your marriage with with, with the kind of past and conflict that it has come about the next is the power of letting go when we've, been in te when we've been offended, the last thing to do is to let go. Yet, 
in a healthy marriage the thing that is necessary is to let go how do we not let go you remember i spoke about the towel on the bed incident two weeks ago he puts a wet towel on the bed right so then he does it eighth time ninth time and after 25 years when he does it again he says you've always done it but the point is to let go just let it just let it slip that um i think a model of this letting go is true with children very often jeremy and nora get into a fight over something you know someone has taken someone's stationery someone has taken something some sweet it always happens so this last week nora came crying to me saying jeremy has taken colors and i was not in a position to deal with that dispute at that time so i just let it be but at the time later when i came back to very vehemently to come and give justice i saw both of them very happily playing and so i later i called nora and said uh, nora but you told me that you were very angry so amma what is it about that right now we're doing a beautiful picture together so that's the power of letting go learning to let go not to bring it back and 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 you know churn it and make butter and cream out of it make sure that we just let go and because when we do so we find that we there has been a much more release for us than there is for our spouse next is seeing the other as christ sees them <clears throat> very often we see or at times there may be the spouse who comes who asks for forgiveness um the the person who has wounded you asks for forgiveness um you know repents and agrees to to be as god wants them to be and what is it necessary for us we need to acknowledge that i need to see them as god sees them sometimes we have rose colored sunglasses we see them through those sunglasses we don't see them as god sees them we see them with the tint and the and the hurt and the and the kind of uh, um, um pain that they have inflicted that's the glasses we wear but god challenges us to see them the way that god sees us and lastly declaring the positive in the face of negatives we need to engage actively in our healing process how do we do that we need to declare the positives based on what god's word says on the promise so even when things are very very bleak even when things are painful even when things are hurting we need to declare the positive declare god's word declare what he has told us says to us in our situation sometimes when people come to us for counseling one of the verses that we very heavily rely on is there will be rejoicing in the tent of the righteous so they will be fighting loggerheads but at the end of the prayer this is what we declare up, declare on their lives there will be rejoicing in the tent of the righteous we need to declare the good things that christ has done for us in spite of what you see around you need to declare the promise of his blessing you need to declare god's word for the healing that you need of your hurts so that you can become what god wants you to be so in conclusion through the challenges marriage brings and through the past that impacts us one truth still remains god has called us a conqueror he has called us an overcomer and he has called us one those who will be led into triumph so let us be wise today to plant his imperishable seed of the word of god in our hearts so that we can truly 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 live abundant and triumphant lives even in the midst of these challenges so i just my prayer just for each one of you whether in whatever sphere of life you are is to hold on to the word of god because when you do your blessing will come thank you may i call upon pastor jakes to <clears throat> let's take this time to uh, to just talk to god and every time we come to his presence it's uh, there's an exchange that happens there's a transaction that happens Isaiah 61 declares that the spirit of the lord the anointing causes the prisoner to step out 
causes the blind eyes to see it gives the oil of joy the oil of gladness in place of mourning he gives us the garments of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness and that's our god and uh, you know whatever we've heard this morning it can be a reality in our lives it need not be something that we heard and something that we forgot this morning can we can we just pray and ask god god i i just want this word to be a reality in my life an experience a tangible experience we thank you lord that you've declared us as overcomers for in you we have peace no matter what we might be going through in life no matter what kind of pain no matter what challenge no matter what difficulty no matter what test what trial in you we are overcomers you know can we declare that this morning is receive that word and say god you have declared it these are the words of the lord jesus he said in this world you will have trials you will have tribulations but be of good cheer for i have overcome the world says the lord and this overcoming is for our sake so that we can in him be overcomers yes lord we come before you this morning with open hearts we come before you this morning in surrender and submission inviting the full work the deep work the thorough work of the spirit in our lives can we tell that to the lord come lord have your way in my heart in my life in my spouse have your way god let there be that exchange let there be that replacement god let there be that aligning and refining this morning
hope today because of that fact because of that truth that he died and rose again and this morning you know there can be a, just a release release of all the pain and release of all the regrets of the past and maybe the present and if we would just receive from him and say god i let go i let go i let go oh god you know you might not be in a place emotionally to let go but can you just make that choice and say god i choose to do this because that's the right thing i choose to do this because your word says so so i release the hurt i release the pain the regrets of the past and i come to a place of saying god i will forgive yes god we will sing salvation songs we will sing songs of hope because you sing those songs over our lives god because you see us as overcomers there's nothing hidden from your eyes you know the pain you know the difficult situations god the circumstances that surround and yet you say and you declare that we are overcomers for your word declares oh god that whatever is born of god overcomes the world so as new creations god as people who have been washed by your precious blood as people who have been filled with your spirit we declare this morning that we are overcomers come on just declare that over your life and say i am an overcomer in christ i am an overcomer in christ i i declare that i agree with the truth of god's word let's just talk to him let's just declare that over our lives let's sing it over our lives i am an overcomer in christ because jesus died and rose again and he sees me as a victorious person he sees me as an overcomer oh i will press on i will press on i will put away these weights that hold me back unnecessarily these weights that weigh me down these things that slow me down I will put these away with the help of our God. I will put these away by the power of the spirit of the living God. And I will press on the regrets of the past, the words that were spoken in the past, the things that were done to me in the past. Oh, I just release it. Thank you, God. Thank you, Master. Thank you, oh God. You know, God wants to heal us. of those emotional wounds and hurts and he wants to heal us completely he wants to heal us so that even the scars don't remain there so make a choice this morning not to revisit those hurts not to revisit not to replay not to experience again what went through in your life god is making a new thing a new start a new beginning even as we put our hands in his and say god i will journey with you you are the balm of gilead the rose of sharon you are the prince of peace in you i have peace and as i will walk through and even as we this morning we've been reminded of the wow that we made at the altar for better for us maybe right now it's a season a night season and it's not really the better things that are happening but we made that choice for better for worse for richer for poorer in sickness and in health and almighty god who was witness at that time when we uttered these words So he is with us he is with us to back up whatever we said to validate to say i'm with you and i will help you through this father we thank you we thank you god we thank you we thank you lord that we are not alone in this journey that you are with us and with you by our side we can run through a troop we can leap over a wall as your word declares let there be an impartation of strength an infusion of faith oh god this morning 
Yes, Lord, let, let there be reconciliation, restoration of relationships, healing of relationships, God. Lord, every home, every family that is represented here, Master, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, O oh God. Your kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we pray an increase of that, God. Lord, we ask for an overflow. Yes, Lord, your word indeed declares that in the tents of the righteous, there will be the voice of rejoicing. And Lord, we decree that this morning, God. We come against every work of the enemy. Every work of the enemy, we nullify it in the name of Jesus. Every attack of the enemy, of the, enemy, of the evil one, oh, we raise up the shield of faith. We choose to stay in your word. We choose to look at things the way you look at things. We choose to say amen to what you say, God. We choose to be in agreement, oh God, with what you've declared, God, this morning. And we choose to walk in victory. We choose to walk triumphantly as overcomers. We thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' master's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. Amen. Let your homes be filled with shalom. Amen. You be filled with shalom. And let's walk as overcomers. God bless you. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.